Now we're moving into a portion of a real analysis course known as like maybe the topology of the real numbers. You want to think about this as like the fine structure of the real number line. We're going to start talking about open sets, which is a really important notion in the study of topology in general. And so that will be a really important notion as we look at the topology of R. And so let's first introduce the notion of an epsilon neighborhood. So given any real number A, and any epsilon which is bigger than zero, the epsilon neighborhood of A is defined by the following set. So we'll generally say the epsilon A, and that's gonna be all values of X that have the property when X minus A in absolute values is less than epsilon. In other words, it's this open interval from A minus epsilon to A plus epsilon, and maybe it's pretty important to think of it like that. Great. And then next, we say that a subset of the real numbers is open if for every A in A there is an epsilon where we can find one of these epsilon neighborhoods that is completely contained in A. Now let's go ahead and look at some examples. So the two like classic examples to start with would be all real numbers. So this set is most definitely open. Notice we can take any A in the real numbers and find an epsilon. Maybe we could just set epsilon equal to one. And notice we have V1A, that's gonna be equal to the open interval A minus one, A plus one, which is definitely a subset of R. Great, so we've just shown that the whole real numbers is an open set under this definition right here. So maybe another classic example to look at would be the complement of the real numbers, in other words, the empty set. And so the empty set is most definitely open because every A inside of the empty set has this property. It's just that there are no A's inside the empty set, so this condition is vacuously satisfied. Our third example will be an arbitrary open interval. Now, it stands to reason that if we name something an open interval, and if we define this notion of an open set, then an open interval should be a special type of an open set. And we'll actually prove this kind of carefully. It's a bit overkill, but it's useful to like see the process. So maybe we'll make this claim for all B and C, which are real numbers, and maybe B is strictly less than C, the open interval, given by B comma C is an open set. Great, so like I said, we're gonna prove this. And so that means we need to start by taking some arbitrary A in the set BC, in other words, on that open interval, and then constructing an epsilon so that the epsilon neighborhood will lie inside of this set. And so just to motivate this, I'll draw a picture. So there's my real number line. So I'm gonna go ahead and put B right here. I'll put C right here. So we're thinking about all the points between B and C, but not including B and not including C. So let's pick a arbitrary A in the middle here. Maybe we'll put it right there. And what we wanna do is really find an open interval centered at A that is completely contained in this interval BC. And so that's exactly like finding one of these epsilon neighborhoods. So what we'll do is we'll look at the distance from B to A and the distance from A to C. We'll take half of that. And if we take half of that, we are guaranteed to be inside of this open interval. So I'll just write it like that. And so this will be my epsilon. And like I said, epsilon will be half the smaller distance between A and the endpoints. So let's maybe write that down carefully. So let's set epsilon equal to half the minimum of these two numbers, A minus B and then C minus A. And notice I did the subtraction in that order for a purpose because A is bigger than B and A is less than C. So I've got two positive numbers there. Okay, great. And now we want to make this following claim 
that V epsilon A is completely contained in this open interval B, C. So let's go ahead and see how that goes. So let's suppose that X is in V epsilon A. So that means X is an element of the epsilon neighborhood. Now we just need to show that X is an element of the open interval to prove that subset relationship here. So notice that that tells us that X is in the open interval A minus epsilon A plus epsilon. But that tells us that X lies between A minus epsilon and A plus epsilon. Good. But then we can replace epsilon with this thing right here. Notice we're taking half the minimum of those two. So if we take half the minimum of those two, then epsilon is most definitely less than each of these individually. So we can make that replacement with an inequality. And if we replace it on this side, the inequality is gonna continue going over to the right. So we have A minus C minus A. So again, we know that epsilon is half the minimum of these two, so that means epsilon is most definitely less than C minus A. And then similarly, we know negative epsilon will be bigger than B minus A. So here we have B minus A plus A. But now after some simplification, here we see in the extreme left-hand side, we have B is less than X, which is less than C. That's the simplification of the extreme right-hand side. But X being between B and C is the same thing as saying that X is on the open interval B to C. So we've just proven that this open interval is in fact an open set. All right, great. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up and then we're gonna look at another result involving open sets. Now we're gonna prove a classic result on unions and intersections of open sets. And this kind of result is true in an arbitrary topology, but here we're just looking at the topology that we have imposed on the real number line. So this first one says that the arbitrary union of open sets is an open set. So here we're thinking about open subsets of the real number line. So if we take an arbitrary union of those, then that is indeed an open set of the real number line itself. Okay, so let's see how this proof goes. So we wanna start with an arbitrary collection of open sets, so let's do that. So let's suppose that we have U sub little i is a subset of R is open for all little i from capital I, which is our indexing set. So here we've got an arbitrary collection, so this indexing set could be finite, could be countably infinite, like the natural numbers or the integers, or it could be uncountably infinite, like the real numbers, or so on and so forth. So here we've got a collection of a bunch of open sets. So now let's just recall what our goal is. So we want to show that the union over all of these indexed sets is open. So looking over here at our precise definition, that means we need to take an arbitrary element from this union and find some epsilon bigger than zero where that epsilon neighborhood will be completely contained in the union. So let's see how that goes. So we'll take an A from this arbitrary union but being from an arbitrary union means that you are at least in one of the sets. So that means A is an element of UJ for some J in our indexing set I. But because UJ is open by our assumption, we can find an epsilon bigger than zero such that V epsilon A, in other words, the epsilon neighborhood centered at A is completely contained in UJ. But now UJ is one of the components of this union, which makes it a subset of the union. So we have this is in fact a subset of this arbitrary union. And again, looking at this subset relationship which we've just constructed, we have the epsilon neighborhood is a subset of the union, which tells us that our union of all of our UIs is an open subset of the real number line. Okay, good. So I'll go ahead and clean this up and we'll look at um, a result 
involving the intersection of some open sets. So now we want to look at a companion result that says the finite intersection of open sets is also an open set. So let's suppose we've got a finite collection of open sets. So we'll write that as U1 all the way up to UN. Those are subsets of R and they are all open. Now the next thing that we want to do is show that their intersection is open again using this definition right here. So we'll take some arbitrary element A from their intersection. We'll write that as U1 intersect all the way up to UN. Great. But what that tells us just by the definition of intersection is that AI is an element of UJ for all J, which lies between one and N. You know, intersection is kind of like an and statement. But each of these are open, which tells us that we've got an epsilon J for each of these UJs built out of this definition right here. So let's go ahead and find that epsilon J. So let's find epsilon J bigger than zero, such that the epsilon J A is a subset of uj. In other words, the epsilon j neighborhood centered at a is contained in this open set uj. Now the next thing that we want to do is find an epsilon kind of to rule them all. In other words, so that our epsilon neighborhood will be contained inside of this intersection. So we want to take the most restrictive epsilon because notice these are all nested inside of each other given that they are all open sets or sorry, I should say open intervals centered at A. And the one that is inside the most will be the minimum of all of these epsilons. So let's set epsilon equal to the minimum of epsilon one, epsilon two, all the way up to epsilon N. So we're taking a minimum of a finite set, and so there's definitely a minimum of that set. And that's where this finiteness is very important. If we had an infinite intersection, then it would be definitely possible to not have a minimum among these. We would have something called an enthemum, if you recall from earlier in the class, and that could be equal to zero, but we want epsilon to be bigger than zero, so that wouldn't work. And I should say that since this is a finite set, we know that this minimum will be positive because we're taking a minimum of positive numbers. And now we want to notice that the epsilon A is going to be a subset of the epsilon J A, and this will be true for all J. And that's because this epsilon is smaller than or equal to epsilon J, but that's gonna be a subset of UJ. Again, this is true for all J. So here we have this guy, is a subset of this guy for all j. But this open interval v epsilon j being a subset of uj for all j is equivalent to saying that v epsilon j, in other words, this epsilon neighborhood centered at a is a subset of this intersection i equals one to n of ui, which is exactly what we needed to do. So I'll get rid of this and we'll look at a classic example where an infinite intersection of open sets is in fact not open. So now I'll provide an example for why exactly we need that finiteness condition for the intersection of open sets. And our example will have to do with these nice open intervals. So we'll set U1 equal to the open interval minus one to one, U2 equal to the open interval minus half to half, and so on and so forth. So in general, UN is the open interval minus one over n to one over n. And this definition is happening for all natural numbers n. Okay, good. Now we wanna make the following claim, and that is the intersection as n goes from one to infinity of u sub n is equal to this singleton, which is zero. And this claim is actually pretty easy to see and pretty easy to prove. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's suppose that X is inside of this intersection. So we've got this intersection from N equals one to infinity of U sub N. But what that means 
is that x is n, the interval minus 1 over n to 1 over n for all n, which are natural numbers. Then the next thing that we can do is take some epsilon bigger than 0 and then find a capital N, which is a natural number, such that 1 over capital N is less than epsilon. So earlier we proved that we were able to do that by the Archimedean principle. Now, now what we want to notice is that x is an element from minus 1 over capital N to 1 over capital N, given the fact that it's in all of these u sub n's. But now we can rewrite that as the absolute value of x is less than epsilon. Now, since our epsilon was chosen arbitrarily, we see that x is less than epsilon for all epsilon bigger than zero. But that tells us that x is in fact equal to zero. So look, we started with an element from the intersection and we showed that that element had to be zero. But what that tells us is that this intersection is in fact just the singleton zero. Now I'm gonna add something to this. And what I'll add is that this singleton is not an open set. And I'll go ahead and erase this proof and then we'll look at the proof of that added statement. Now let's look at the proof of this added statement that this singleton set zero is not an open set. And this is gonna be true for all singleton sets. In order to do that, we need to flip the definition of an open set to the definition of a set not being open. So let's recall we do that by changing all the for alls to there exists and then flipping all of the statements to their negatives. So here we would say a set, which is a subset of R, is said to be not open if there exists an A in A such that for all epsilon bigger than zero, we have the epsilon neighborhood is not contained in A. So let's see how this negated definition can be applied to our setup. So we need to find some A from our set, but we don't have much choice here because we have a singleton. And then we should be able to say for all epsilon bigger than zero, this epsilon neighborhood is not a subset of the singleton. But what that means is that there will be an element from the epsilon neighborhood that is not an element from the singleton. So we don't actually have to look that hard. Let's notice that for all epsilon bigger than zero, we have, for example, epsilon over two is an element of minus epsilon to epsilon, which is equal to V epsilon centered at zero. But, Epsilon over 2 is not equal to 0, given the fact that epsilon is not equal to 0, which tells us epsilon over 2 is not an element of this singleton. So it follows that this epsilon neighborhood is not a subset of this singleton, meaning that this singleton is not open. Okay, and that's a good place to stop.